distance. The beam ship is determined to be precisely where Billy said it was, and mathematical triangulation gives its size, seven meters, or about 21 feet in diameter. Junichi, like our team, had been fascinated by the Meyer photography, yet cautious. He had investigated UFOs around the world and never before seen photographs or movie footage this detailed. It seemed too good to be true. Yet when questions arose, there was always another piece of footage to stir the sense of wonder. Close examination of this footage clearly shows the craft moving behind the large tree. When the size of the beam ship is compared to that of the tree and the farmhouse, it becomes obvious that it would be impossible to suspend it with strings. In addition, the top of this enormous tree is seen to move as the craft passes over it. This movement can be attributed to the backwash of air created by the beam ship. With a full day scheduled, we left the farmhouse early to visit more contact sites. As we rounded a curve, Billy halted the Land Rover to point out his native village, Hindwell. As the cameraman began to film the valley, sounds of a small aircraft could be heard over the natural sounds of the Swiss countryside, and another mystery begins to unfold. Wanting to re-examine the site at Hassenbull, Junichi and his crew began lining up Billy's shots with the natural landmarks in the area. But as he begins the interview, the mysterious airplane returns, ruining the soundtrack and forcing a decision to move on to the next site, Schmarbuhl. After two hours of driving, we reached the village of Schmarbuhl. Filming had just begun when Junichi interrupted the interview. Is that, uh... And there is, uh, you know, there is an airplane out there, a train that uh, every time we take a picture, we take a videotape, mm -hmm. you know, the airplane kind of... Always are airplanes around, you know. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> they are watching us. Once again discouraged, we traveled to Winkle Riot, some 50 miles to the southeast. And the uh, next thing, next one is the... is somewhere from here. That's in that direction, yeah. You see here the saddle in the... Yes. And the forests there on the horizon, mm -hmm. and the ship a little bit more left by side. Yes. Now it was cloudy at that time. It was cloudy at that day. Now we can hear the uh, sounds of the airplane again. Yeah. <sighs> it's always the same. You see, when I got all my pictures, my films, all the times were of their airplanes. Mm. Practically by every place where I shot pictures. Okay. Oh. Junichi was visibly frustrated by the uninvited intruder. Meyer was obviously under surveillance, but he had been for some time. Lee remembers. And he hasn't taken any uh, Jim, he hasn't taken any daylight footage for two years. Mm -hmm. There's been several reasons to that, as we understand it. One has been the fact that two years ago, Billy was under heavy surveillance. Mm -hmm. We don't know who it was. All we know, there was a Volkswagen that was equipped with uh, what appeared to be uh, parabolic microphones, maybe some form of ground-to-ground -ground radar. I don't know. But they followed him everywhere he went. Every time he went out for a contact, he had a shadow with him. Billy's problems actually began in 1976 with the first release of his story and some of the photos to the European press. Soon, every major magazine and newspaper featured an article on Billy Meyer. These sensational press releases were responsible for bringing in hordes of well-wishers, friends, curiosity seekers, and in overall, a general public seeking more information. But it also attracted the negative element. After a close call on his life, 
Billy armed himself and became less trusting. So uh, finally, uh, he just quit. They stopped having contacts in daylight hours, and they moved them up early evening, and eventually they went into the early wee hours of the morning. Herbert Runkel recalls one such event. It was uh, near Hinville. It was in the night, near 1 o'clock in the morning, and Billy was going to a contact, and Semyaza told him that after the contact, she will give a demonstration for the people, and when the contact was finished, uh, we can see there are many other people also stay there. We can see the ship is rising out of the wood, going to the sky, stopped. It was a dark red light, mm -hmm. and then stopped, going to the right, going to the left. And I have a camera with me, a Super 8 movie mm -hmm. camera. Mm -hmm. And I tried to get it in the objective, but I was so <laughs> nervous. Uh -huh. Also present at the demonstration was Hans Schutzbach. He too was nervous, but he did manage to take this interesting night footage. Here the beam ship jumps, as was described by Herbert earlier, becoming brighter, then disappearing. Some of the best stills taken during the demonstration belong to an Austrian man, Guido Musburger. Another photograph he took that evening was even more intriguing. Guido's daughter, Anita, holds the picture as he traces the distinct outline of the beam ship. Guido's photo remained an oddity until a few months later when a second unusual photograph appeared. Wendell explains. A stranger seeing somebody off on an airliner at Floaten Airport here in Zurich had simply taken a picture of the airliner with a Polaroid camera. When the picture came out of the camera, this is what she got. She put it in an envelope with a note saying that this thing happened at the airport. She didn't know anything about these things, and she didn't want anybody to know who she was. And she put it in an envelope and mailed it to the newspaper with no return address. Mm -hmm. The newspaper published the picture, inviting her to get in contact with them so they could pay for it. But the picture is unique because it has a similar space-shaped spacecraft. It has a field around it and an expanded field here. Mm -hmm. The picture was taken to a local photo photography shop. Uh, a man recognized it as an expert here in Zurich who looked at the picture and said he couldn't account for any way that this picture could get on this film, on Polaroid film. Mm -hmm. The lady did not remember seeing anything when she took the picture except the airplane. There were other witnesses, too. Most were disbelievers at first, until they had their own experiences. When Calliope, or Bobby as she is called, first learned of the contacts, she questioned her husband's sanity. In South Pacific, in June, boy, she's all she's yet. Today, after many personal sightings, she finds the encounter's routine and feels that the Palladian message to mankind is far more important than the evidence. The Meyer children openly discuss their sightings. They're proud of their father's contacts. Atlantis displays a painting of an object that he, his older sister Gilgamesha, and his younger brother Methuselah observed while waiting for their father to return from a contact. And then, uh, then, uh, and they get flown. Ist das so rüber, dann wieder so, und dann ist das ausgegangen. Jakobus Bürtschinger works on the farm and has witnessed many things. Sie hat sich tiptop zweck gemacht, nachdem, dass er wieder retour gekommen ist, nach 20 Stunden. Das erste, was mir aufgefallen ist, als er heimgekommen ist, da hat er so einen richtig fünftägigen Bart gehabt. Displaying an artist's sketch that illustrates one such experience, he shrugs the numerous daytime and evening events off as no big thing. Engelbert Wachter and his wife Maria were drawn to the case by a magazine article that appeared in Switzerland. Wir sind, respektive der Billy, ist dann von der Semiase dirigiert worden durch hunderte von Strössli und Wägli bis wir in die Nähe 